a Frenchman. It's the Eiffel Tower to a Dutchman. It's a pretty flower to an Indian. It's a monument to a smoker. It's a Kent. The taste of Kent. The taste of Kent. The taste of Kent. More taste by tobacco. To the Irish. It's a leprechaun to a Grecian. It's the Parthenon to a Scotsman. It's his regiment to a smoker. It's a Kent. The taste of Kent. The taste of Kent. The taste of Kent. More taste, fine tobacco. If you smoke a filter cigarette, try the taste of Kent. Marlboro Country. You get a lot to like with a Marlboro filter, flavor, pack, or box. Come to where the flavor is. Famous Marlboro Red or new Marlboro 100s, the Longhorns. Come to Marlboro Country. Tonight's CBS Reports begins with this historic announcement by the Surgeon General of the United States on January 11th, 1964. It is the judgment of the committee that cigarette smoking contributes substantially to mortality from certain specific diseases and to the overall death rate. That was three months ago. Today, the implications of this report to the nation's health and to its economy are just beginning to dawn. In the rural area, if we lose our tobacco, we're gonna be hurting pretty bad now, that's for sure. If it will be a gradual process, we might, some can survive. If it comes all at once, uh, I think we're all going to go down to drink. At stake are the incomes of 750,000 families who farm the nation's fifth largest cash crop, the jobs of 96,000 men and women involved in tobacco manufacturing, the $8 billion a year tobacco industry, which pays more than $3 billion in federal, state, and local taxes, and $150 million worth of cigarette advertising with the ethical and moral problems it poses for all media especially television. If a next door neighbor came to you and said to your son or your daughter, smoke, it's a good thing. Here, try this. It'll make you seem like a man. You'd probably throw him out of the house on his ear. Well, equivalently, persuasive advertising is doing something very, very similar. Here now is CBS News correspondent, Harry Reasoner. This is the exhibit hall at the annual convention of the National Association of Tobacco Distributors and some of the products being shown to these 6,000 wholesalers. Quite plainly, these men are not completely dependent on cigarettes. But equally plainly, anything that affects cigarette sales is big news to them. Last year, this country produced and distributed $8 billion worth of tobacco products. There are something like a million and a half retail outlets for cigarettes, many of which tempt smokers with everything from pens to playing cards. This is the size of the economic edifice that would be threatened by any substantial and permanent change in American cigarette smoking habits. Dr. Luther L. Terry, Surgeon General of the United States. My advice to the smoker would be to stop cigarette smoking. Uh, my advice to the person who has not started smoking is don't start. Tonight, we ask several questions. What has happened since the Surgeon General's report? Has there been, is there likely to be, any remedial action? And finally, what moral or ethical obligation does this pose to the United States government, the tobacco industry, the advertising agencies that promote the sale of cigarettes to the tune of $150 million a year, the newspaper, magazine, radio, and television stations and networks that carry this advertising, including the station and network you are now watching. 
The cigarette health controversy has caused a collision of interests on a grand scale. The forces of public health are attempting to change the smoking habits of 70 million Americans. To the farmers of North Carolina, the Surgeon General's report represents one kind of threat. To the teenagers of Newton, Massachusetts, it represents another. Now, in the light of the Surgeon General's report on smoking, the report of the Royal College of Physicians, and other similar reports, I consider it completely unnecessary to go into the medical evidence against cigarette smoking. I will give you one statistic only. If present trends in smoking continue, then one million present school children in the United States will die of lung cancer before they reach the age of 70 years. Dr. Eva Salbert, senior research associate at Harvard School of Public Health, recently completed a four-year study of the smoking habits of 7,000 Newton junior and senior high school students. Recently, the South African-born physician led a discussion at Newton South High School. I'm sort of inclined to, to believe that this report will die out as a lot of other the, uh, the other Senate investigating committees and uh, governmental reports. It uh, has an impact in the beginning, and a lot of people say, oh, I'm going to die if I don't start smoking, I'm going to start smoking. Um, I know several people who, as soon as the report came out, decided to stop smoking right then and there. But I look at the report as maybe a spark that sets off the flame. I think that now is the time to do something about what you've wanting, been wanting to do all along. And I also feel, as Chuck does, that if this report isn't continually repeated and stressed, that it may die out and people will just forget about it. Well, I don't think the report uh, strikes close enough to home. Uh, I admit that it probably will uh, discourage some smokers. But uh, in general, I think that unless a person uh, sees somebody who has been smoking for a long time and does develop a, uh, a very bad cough or does eventually develop cancer, that uh, I don't think it's going to do too much good. You see the advertisements on television, and smoking just seems to be the thing to do. And you see the attractive couples, you see them sitting on a beach, and they instinctively light up a cigarette. I mean, this is the thing to do. You see them walking in the country, and they can't take a walk in the country without a cigarette. The, the cigarette is an essential part of the picture. It completes the picture. The people smoking are always very attractive, very beautiful people, and they're the advertisements usually portray oh, either a very romantic setting or in sports sort of a very vir virile image of a man. And in, well, some advertisements have a man and a woman in a very, in a very romantic setting. And subconsciously you could think of yourself uh, in this place Basically, they say, well, if you smoke this brand, you'll have a new girl, a new job, you'll make $50,000 a year, and you'll be a water skier. Now, uh, <laughs> that, I think, has a, a great effect on the younger people. But uh, I think I was basically influenced by my parents and my uh, sister in the home life. Uh, my parents didn't make a great effort to stop me. They told me that uh, it wasn't good for me. The only thing they didn't want me to do was smoke in public. I feel it was more that my friends started smoking, and we did it to make ourselves appear older. When we were in junior high school, we looked up and saw the high school students smoking, and we wanted to associate ourselves with them. This, I think, is the main reason why I started. And it just became a habit that was hard to break, and I haven't as yet stopped. Father Thomas Garrett is the author of many publications dealing with business ethics and is professor of philosophy at the University of Scranton. Is it immoral for the media that carry cigarette advertising, newspapers, magazines, television, which is licensed in the public interest, is it immoral for them to carry these ads? If the advertising were nothing but a simple picture of the package and the name of the product, I don't think we'd see any real moral problem. But when they start, let us say, to urge the young to use cigarettes, ah, we've got a problem. And notice, Mr. Reasoner, that in the last four or five years, there's been a shift in cigarette advertising with the appeals directed to the young. Let's put it this way. The man who drives the getaway car in a bank robbery is as guilty as the man who goes inside and holds the gun on the teller. And when you're cooperating as a media owner or writer, you're involved in it too. 
It's been suggested that the, uh, the real cigarette test for this country is the, to find out whether something which is so good for us economically and apparently so bad for our health, whether this kind of an issue can be resolved in a democracy. Do you believe it can? Well, I believe it can be resolved, but I wonder if it will be resolved. And I'll tell you why. I I'm a little uh, cynical, as I said before. I'm afraid that there will be a big brouhaha, uh, smoke and fire, and the thing will die quietly off. And in between, I think the eyes of the public will have goof of dust scattered in them. May I give you an example of that? Last night, there was a commercial call for X cigarette, and it went something like this. We bring you an important message. X, uh, no other cigarette according to any survey, is better medically than X cigarette. This is not a claim. This is a fact. Practically implied it was a public service. Now, if you analyze that, you'll see that that's pure, unadulterated, 100% goofy dust. It gives you the vague impression, maybe there's something good about this, and it tries to say poo-poo to all these reports. And I'm afraid we're going to have a rash of this type of counter-propaganda. Father Garrett, do you know advertising men who really believe that uh, smoking is not harmful to health, that the case hasn't been proven? Well, I don't know any of them, and uh, after all, they don't allow illiterates on Madison Avenue. Do you think that they see a moral situation? Uh, I would say most of them do, but I'm a little cynical in that some of the most uh, moral, shall we say, are those without cigarette accounts. And <laughs> I think we have to face this. Author of the recently published Confessions of an Advertising Man, the Scottish-born chairman of the board is David Ogilvy. He invented the man with the eye patch for Hathaway shirts, but he refuses to accept cigarette clients. We've handled two cigarette accounts in our day, but that was before the Royal College of Physicians report. We read the Royal College Physicians' Report when it first came out. It seemed to us the conclusions were inescapable. We decided then as a company that we would not want to accept any cigarette advertising. We would not want to handle it. And when the Surgeon General's Report came out, we, were con we uh, repeated that decision. What do you think about American cigarette commercials? Disgraceful. Uh, I watch these commercials. I see the handsome, athletic young man drawing in a mouthful of cigarette smoke and then inhaling it down into his lungs. And I'm appalled to think that I belong to the profession which can perpetrate that kind of villainy. I see other cigarette commercials which are written by what we call in our business weasel merchants, which are essays in the art of casuistry. They're intellectually dishonest. The men who, know, who wrote them and who paid for them know it. Mr. Ogilvy, suppose you had to prepare an anti-smoking campaign. What are some of the techniques you might use? We would show admirable people who do not smoke, people that the young would want to identify themselves with, we might show some of the people who are addicted cigarette smokers and what miserable, neurotic fellows they're apt to be. And I, for one, wouldn't hesitate to show the youth and all viewers once again what it's like when you have terminal lung cancer, what sort of a way it is to get out of this world. Some ad spokesmen say, Whatever can be sold legally can be advertised legally. What do you think of this argument? Perhaps this all comes down in the last uh, uh, to a matter of individual conscience. If there's an advertising man whose conscience is not troubled by advertising cigarettes, perhaps he can advertise them. If there's a network whose president's conscience is not troubled by taking money for his stockholders for running cigarette commercials, perhaps they can be run. Senator Maureen Newberger also testified. 
I'm most concerned about the cynical attitude of the tobacco industry, that uh, uh, they don't want the Federal Trade Commission to issue any uh, regulations that are uh, going to fear with the economy, as they call it, of the industry. Well, I have admit everywhere that uh, this is a, a big uh, multi-billion dollar industry in our country. But nevertheless, I think uh, it's a pretty cynical attitude if we don't take a, a certain amount of consideration for the fact that the health and welfare of uh, 190 million Americans is at stake. We asked Father Garrett if he favored the FTC's proposal to label cigarettes as a health hazard. What I'm afraid is, Mr. Reasoner, that this may be used as an excuse for doing nothing else. You know, we've been good boys, uh, we've labeled them, the public is warned, and now let it drop. And human beings being what they are, it will drop. And people will go on just as they are with uh, the printing down there at the bottom of the pack and no continual reminder of what's really at stake. Discover the clean difference. The clean, clean difference in today's smoking with new Bel Air cigarettes. Breathe easy, smoke clean with new Bel Air. Now, breathe easy. Bel Air has the clean difference in taste. New air fresh menthol blend or a clean breath of freshness in every puff. Breathe easy. Bel Air has the clean difference of a deep set, recessed filter. Set deep where the filter belongs. Yes, breathe easy, smoke clean, with the clean difference in taste, the clean difference of a deep set filter tip. Breathe easy, smoke clean, with new Bel Air. The clean difference in smoking. You seem happy today. Well, why shouldn't I be? I have the two things that would make any man happy. A gorgeous wife, and I'm smoking a kid. Which do you like the best? Now, there's a tough one. <laughs> you see, for cooking and for dancing and kissing, you satisfy best. <laughs> but for filter and taste, Kent satisfies best. I'll accept that. 